Okay. So uh, my name is Maurice Matisse. I'm one of those best friends, as Gartner uh, called them earlier. And my role here today is uh, to introduce uh, the section that we're going to talk about some of the CCNMTL projects. But uh, before I do that, I do want to take a moment to thank uh, a few folks. I want to thank Jim Neal and his staff who helped us so much in putting together this uh, event. Um, I also want to thank the staff of CCNMTL who worked tirelessly, tirelessly to uh, create the, uh, the forum that we're at, and uh, Robbie McClintock, who has been the other partner in putting this together. Thank you all. Um, but more than anything, uh, I think I'm thankful that so many of you have shown up to share this moment. Uh, I want to welcome all of you. I know many of you have traveled from afar, and it's been great uh, having an opportunity to briefly say hello to many of you, and I'm sure we'll get a chance to chat some more later in the day, but again, really a big welcome from us to all of you who have uh, come today. What we're going to do today in the, in the section on CCNMTL is we're going to continue kind of the theme that Robbie and the Dalton group started about looking at some of the work that Frank did that was more about education than it was about technology, about creating spaces where the student was the focus of the effort. The, the self-active student, I think, is what Robbie uh, characterized it in some of the program notes. And what we're going to do is take a look at a couple of those signature projects uh, of the center, but they were also Frank's signature projects. Uh, it will be obvious, uh, I think, when we look at the Brownfield Action Project, how it follows the archaeotype project that he started at Dalton. Uh, we'll also look at the multimedia study environment. Now, the multimedia study environment is something we worked on and did created 17 of those, and we'll be showing a couple of those. Um, and again, they also take root in that same article I think was referenced earlier, the, uh, A Place for Study that Robbie wrote and Frank used to bring in and he made all the staff at the center read it and it was like a homework assignment for us. And um, the, the, when we get to the Malcolm X uh, 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 MSC, the other thing that uh, reminds me is that special relationship that we and Frank especially built with Manning Marable and eventually that, uh, that the work there was instrumental in his work, The Life of Reinvention, which eventually became a Pulitzer Prize winning book in 2012. Um, I wanna, uh, before we get started, uh, I wanna also express my appreciation to Ryan and Dave Mealy for their willingness to come from their busy worlds to share these two projects with us. One of the things that, um, uh, you know, over the years, we've shared so many different projects and we probably could have picked uh, a, a dozen of these to demo. And again, we use the word demo because one of Frank's mantras was, mantras was always demo instead of explain and hopefully we'll do a little bit of that. Um, David is, uh, uh, is uh, com completed two tours of duty with uh, CCNMTL. He came, left, and he saw that he had missed it and came back. Um, and Ryan stayed with the center for about a dozen years, uh, starting out as a part-time student, then as an educational technologist, and eventually becoming one of the directors at the center till he left in December of 2012. So uh, what we're gonna do is um, we're gonna have Ryan lead off. He's gonna do a demonstration of the Brownfield Action Project, and then David Mealy will talk a little bit about the multimedia study environments. Let me bring Ryan up. Uh, good morning, everyone. I uh, wanted to thank Maurice for getting our band back together so we could sing some of these old songs. Um, <laughs> this is kind of fun to do. I feel like I'm on one of those reunion tour kind of things. So um, I'm glad Maurice also mentioned the thing about the demo. It's my duty to uh, execute a demo. Uh, one thing Frank always talked about was he couldn't stand uh, sitting through presentations about educational technology or educational software where the person neglected to show the very thing that they were talking about or even postponed it beyond 30 seconds. So uh, I'm not gonna pause much at all, uh, except to point out the one other principle that he always had, which was don't show anything without s mentioning some kind of context to put the person in place. Uh, I think that the word context is a word that he used daily and it was a, a great reminder as we all 
were kind of distracted by all these various technologies and things that, you know, whoever you were with needed to uh, frame things for people so they had a sense for what you were talking about. So uh, the context for Brownfield Action, uh, you have to put yourself back in 1999, and uh, I was 14 at the time as a new graduate student at Teachers College. <laughs> um, and I met Frank, and he said he was going to talk with this guy, Maurice, and they were thinking about making this center. This was in the fall of 98. And then right away, in the spring of 1999, I met Peter Bauer. Uh, Peter Bauer, I don't know if he's here. I don't see him at the moment. Yeah. Uh, maybe he'll be here later. Um, Peter is a dynamic instructor at Barnard College of uh, what's called the Introduction to Environmental Science Sequence. And just as we heard described in the, in the comments about Dalton uh, before, uh, Peter was really interested in trying to disrupt the traditional mode of instruction. And he'd watched his children start playing these games like SimCity. Uh, he had this uh, interesting board game that he had his students trying to do in his uh, lab. Uh, and again, this is about 120 young women uh, every year whose last fun thing they could imagine doing on Earth would be to take a science course. Uh, so we were talking about people who, this was going to be their last gasp at touching science if they had their way, uh, if we didn't do something to change that. And so, I coming in to the center as the one person with a science degree said, sure, I'll, I'll talk with Peter, we'll figure something out. And uh, lo and behold, 14 years later, uh, despite what you might hear about technology sort of dissipating and fading away quickly and things getting out of date, 14 years later, this uh, piece of software is still being used. It's being used all over the country. It's being used by uh, people who experienced it as students, went on to become teachers and now use it with their own students. Uh, so. Uh, these things can live on, and obviously Frank's impact is obvious once you see how it works. So let's start it up. So that's uh, Mark Raymond there on the right, who's in the audience, and Peter Bauer uh, on the left. Uh, the way we set the stage for this uh, experience for students is uh, there's a mall developer in this fictional town, and he wants to uh, knock down this old factory and replace it with one of his malls. But he's concerned that uh, if he does that, given how legislation works, uh, that he might be responsible for the environmental cleanup of that site if he were to buy it. And this is the local cable access news show uh, where he's being interviewed and talking about uh, his plans a little bit. And good morning, everyone. I'm Frank O'Ryan here on Orion's Express, reporting to you today, as I do every week, from the studios here at Esker County Cable Access Television. Thanks for tuning in. Today, the latest in pesticide technologies. We'll be visiting the local vineyards, plus the weekly dining report. But first, a late-breaking development concerning all residents. Mr. Seymour Buckmeister, president of Malls R Us, is here with us in the studios today to talk about possible mall construction in Moraine Township. Good morning, and welcome to the show, Mr. Buckmeister. Thanks, Frank. Thanks for inviting me to your show. Uh, what's, the, what's this about a new mall for Moraine? Uh, what's in the works, and what's in it for us here in Moraine? We plan to develop the abandoned factory site, uh, known as the self loom property in Moraine, and build a high-tech mini-mall. Uh, this mall will bring jobs uh, to Moraine, mm -hmm. and it will bring services and access to services that presently are difficult uh, to find in Moraine. Uh, and it will bring in tax dollars. Um, presently, uh, no taxes are being received from this property because it's been taken over by the city for non-payment of taxes. Okay, great. Uh, two questions. When is construction going to begin and how long is this going to take? We'd like to begin as soon as possible, but as you know, a new state and federal law uh, make Malls R Us responsible for any contamination uh, on the property. If we own the property, we own the pollution on the property and the financial responsibility for cleaning it up. So it's in our self-interest to make sure that the property is free and clear of any contamination. 
So we're uh, presently negotiating a contract with an environmental consulting firm. So I think we can probably stop it there. He mentions this consulting firm, and just as you're kind of wondering, okay, well, what does this have to do? With, where, what, where do the students fit in here? The students come in cold, and they've only seen Peter as their lecturer up to this point, and now he's playing the role of this mall developer in this game. And the, uh, what the students are in for is they're going to be hired by uh, this mall developer to be an investigator in this town. And it's going to be Peter's way of educating the students about all of the kind of fundamental aspects of uh, environmental science from the point of view of this one narrative. And uh, again, it, it's simulated getting your hands dirty, digging in the same way that you saw this morning if you were here for the Dalton presentation. Uh, and to me, you know, it was such a joy watching the students sort of crack up when they saw Peter in this role because he's such a serious and compelling lecturer. But uh, we were asking them to step outside of themselves a little bit and try to uh, take on something that they might not otherwise consider, which sounds a lot like what Frank asks all of us to do all the time. So this is then what the interface looks like. And I should say, it, probably 20 people in this room have contributed to this project. Uh, Dave, who's going to be up here in a little bit, uh, worked on it in the early days. I know I thought I saw Dave Nesselson in the back. Uh, there are probably 20, 25 people at least who've contributed to this project. And that was through a combination of my t arm twisting, uh, pizza, a uh, variety of other things uh, in the early days. And then since then, people much brighter than me uh, making this thing a very dynamic and uh, exciting tool for, for students to use year after year after year. So what do the students do? Well, uh, you have this map, sort of a bird's eye view of the town. And one of the first things you're asked to do is sort of go around and survey the town. So there's a little red dot that would uh, kind of follow you around as you examine each of the different uh, places in the town. And then once you've kind of had that history down, the idea was to examine uh, through conversation, uh, who knows what in this town? And in, I don't know if in the back you can see who's in the bottom right corner there, but uh, it's no secret that we put Frank in the game uh, as the gas station attendant uh, in this town. <laughs> um, he didn't want a prominent role, but nonetheless, I thought it was appropriate that he be the first stop uh, in, as, you, uh, as you entered from the state road coming in from the west. So the, what the students would do, and they worked in pairs. Uh, this was team-based learning, done in a laboratory setting. And we had all of the ups and downs of trying to convince the lab instructors who were used to that stage on the stage model uh, to step aside and let the students really drive the learning. Uh, and if you're an insomniac, you can read 282 pages that I wrote about that uh, if you visit the TC library. Uh, but I don't recommend it. Um, so. What could you do? Well, I, I always like going to the bar, and Frank always liked that too. So uh, one thing you could do is visit the town bar, and you could ask some questions of the bartender. Hello, I'm Jack Kilroy. Welcome to Kilroy's Bar. Filmed at the West End, for those uh, who are locals. And uh, we had a series of questions that uh, we derived from the students the first couple of years when we were kind of in the prototype phase that then we automated within the tools. So students could ask things like, are you aware of any health cases or environmental concerns? That could be the result of pollution. Everything is within regulation. Anybody who tells you he's sick from a little bug spray in his wine just can't hold his alcohol. The only health issue that comes to mind is the disease that killed Mal Sanger a few years back. But they never quite figured out how he got sick. I don't think it was pollution, though. He was cleaning septic tanks up till his final hospitalization. That's dedication. That was Bob Highsmith from back in the early, early days of the center, uh, playing the role of the bartender, who happens to also be the former police chief. And if you'd read the town's newspaper as a student, you would have known that. And you could have asked him a few more questions, because he actually knows a lot more things than just uh, what he's doing there to protect himself from any accusations that you know he's using uh, products that might have had pesticides attached to them. But he did give a bunch of clues there. And so what the students do, uh, they, in a sense, construct a kind of CSI map as a team kind of on the wall about, well, who in this town's telling the truth? Who has things to hide? Who maybe used to work at the factory? What can they tell me? And that's all in an effort then to be able to uh, perform a series of environmental tests on the ground. And this is where kind of the data set of this tool 
gets a little more obvious. See how I'm kind of zooming way in here now? There's an enormous data set here, and even you know, through hundreds and hundreds of times, no student pair is ever going to come up with the exact same set of data. But we had a series of tools that the students learned to use, and uh, that would draw out uh, what was happening underneath the surface here. Uh, you know, the mall developers concerned that perhaps the uh, the factory was contaminating the land, of course, turns out to be true. Sorry, spoiler alert. Uh, and uh, the, what they're doing is they're dumping radioactive waste into their septic system. Now, again, most Barnard undergraduates don't even know what a septic system is. And so uh, there's quite a bit of uh, new territory to cover in the curriculum. And, you know, Frank was very helpful in kind of reminding Peter and myself, you know, to get to primary sources as quickly as we could. So out went the environmental science textbook, in came the medical dictionary, in came the legal dictionary. Uh, let's go get a real story of where this really happened that people read alongside this. So uh, that became the civil action story that many people uh, probably know or have read. And so you know, over many years, what I took from this was not that this tool, for which I've barely shown you, you know, 5% of it, has done, uh, on its own, but you know how it's changed so much teaching and how it's changed so many students. I, I think I tried to add it up roughly while I was sitting here. How many students have used this? You know, we're well over a thousand at Barnard alone, and you know we're into the you know probably approaching ten thousand if we look across all the different schools that have put this into practice in different places. And for me, it's not about the tools at all, as, been, as has been said already. So I won't dwell on it, but. It's really about how it transforms how a person feels about their learning, and in this case, how they feel about science. What we were really aiming for was not to turn all 120 of these women into scientists, but that they would all develop some kind of relationship to science where rather than telling me when I was doing my dissertation, oh, environmental science, that's like recycling, right? Uh, that that's an actual quote uh, from, from the beginning before having gone through this experience. To instead, that same student saying to me uh, after she came back from Thanksgiving break, you know, I went home for Thanksgiving and I brought my laundry home, you know, as every college student does, right? And uh, I went into the laundry room of my parents' house and I, I put the clothes in and I, and I grabbed their laundry detergent and I happened to notice on the back of it this label of, of the ingredients that were, that were in the detergent and I got really upset and I, I got into a big argument with my family uh, at Thanksgiving about uh, the, the detergent that my family was using and convinced them that they should abandon it and, and use something else instead. And to me, that was like, that was like the perfect Frank moment right there. That was like, okay, <laughs> we got a family to have an argument. Is that the point? <laughs> um, no, no. The point was, a person has kind of made this education real for themselves in their real life, and they've, they've made an argument about something with some evidence. They've related it to themselves, and whether that person becomes a lawyer or I don't know what she went on to become, but uh, that's what made this successful in my eyes. Uh, was that it, it was something that almost every student in that class could grab onto in some way and then appropriate towards wherever they were going. And that, to me, was just classic Frank. So thanks very much. <laughs>